Welcome to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer, and I'm so happy to see all of you today. Gosh, this is uh, just a complete surprise, a very pleasant one, uh, because I wasn't planning on going live today. I thought, well, NASA's doing a press conference today at 3 p.m., and uh, then they're even doing another press event at 4 p.m. I thought, well, gosh, I guess I could just not go live nobody wants to see me and then folks were asking if i could go live and so here we are today because you know what's happening today my friends we are going to l2 the james webb space telescope arrives at l2 or maybe to say a bit more precisely webb isn't so much arriving at l2 so much as it's avoiding l2 by going into orbit around it All right so it, that, it's still a huge a huge moment uh in this incredible journey that Webb has been on and it's one that's just beginning I mean as as the Grateful Dead sang, you know what a long strange trip it's been but it's only at the beginning my friends so let me just welcome a few folks to see that we got wow we got Uruguay checking in hello Wilmer good to see you and thank you very much for coming in today uh, let's see who else is coming in I'd like to just let me know in the chat where you're watching from and if you happen to be uh, on Twitter or anything like that and you want to share this out, please do feel free to tweet this uh, stream out and let folks know that you're watching. And we're just so glad to have you joining us. So we have we have Raj uh, Luthra from Surrey, England. Hello and good to see you. We have Daz checking in from Wales. And uh, yes, Apostolos Bevis, good to see you. Hello and thank you for so much. Oh, we got Alaska checking in. How and Munich and Austria and South Wales, South Wales. Okay, and we got Brazil. Good grief! Wow. And hey, you know what though? You think all those places are exotic? We've got Delaware checking in right up the road, right up on I-95. Uh, Love my Delaware. And, oh, Philly is here. Yay, Joe from Philly is here. So fantastic. All right. Well, we got quite a few folks. And by the way, if you're from Antarctica, I'm just looking at all the... Wow, okay. Sweden, Netherlands, Puerto Rico. Oh, the old south. Wow, the plain old south. Okay, if you're from Antarctica, I really want to know. Okay. Anyway, uh, so here we are. We are at the arrival of L2. Um, please do feel free to comment if if my audio is too high or anything like that. Um, I know that I'm waiting for some moderators to come in, uh, but, um, uh, well, you know, Richard, I mean, anyway. Um, and oh, thank you very much, Pero, for the super chat from Croatia. Thank you and welcome. Okay, so I want to get into what it is we're going to be talking about today because I've got a great guest coming on none other than the James Webb Space Telescope project scientist uh, Dr. Klaus uh, Pontabadan uh, uh, who is in fact just joining right now as I speak so he's just getting uh, himself into the green room but he is the project scientist for James Webb at the Space Telescope Science Institute which just happened to be a place that I used to work at myself so you know uh, so Klaus is the uh, you know the James Webb project scientist my old job anyway uh, and uh, he's joining us uh, let me go ahead and introduce him right now since we happen to have him here uh, there he is Dr. Klaus Pontamadin uh, from Space Telescope our JWST project scientist hello Klaus and good afternoon thank you so much for joining us today well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It is wonderful uh, to have you, and I'm so excited. So, uh, Klaus, it's a big day today. Uh, we're now approaching or getting into orbit around L2, or maybe there's a burn going on somewhere in space as we speak, and there's a little rocket engine on the bottom of Webb that's pushing it off into its orbit around L2. Uh, how is, I know that you're working from home today, but uh, how is the overall vibe at the Institute uh, about uh, today's orbit insertion? Well, I, I, the vibe has been as, as it has been throughout uh, all the major deployment and commissioning so far um, has been, it's been great. Uh, you know, I think everybody, you know, we, we have, we have a, we have a great professional team. Um, they've, they've been doing a great job. Uh, but you know, you also see how how excited people are that we that we are, we, you know, we've done all the deployments. Everything has been going so well. 
And we're starting to get this feeling, I think everybody's starting to get this feeling of where we're really, you know, we're going to have this telescope. And, you know, before launch, of course, a lot of people would say, like, it's not going to, you know, this is a very complex thing. You know, it's, it's hard to do, you know, maybe it won't work. And, and the confidence that we start seeing uh, around the building now is just, it's just amazing. So, so people are really starting to feel this is going to happen. So, would you, so, so you've noticed a, uh, a real shift in the tone. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of uh, working anxiety and that just seems to be just ebbing away with each and every milestone? Yeah, of course. I mean, we've been doing a whole bunch of things that have never been done before in space. Right? It's really the first time, the first time we, we deploy this, this big sun shield in this way. Uh, the first time we deploy a mirror, um, you know, all these first times. So, of course, I mean, we, we, you know, you got you to gotta say, right, I mean, we haven't done this before. Let's, let's demonstrate that it can actually be done. And only when it's actually done can you breathe your sigh of relief. So, so yeah, I mean, there's been a change in, in tone, I think it's fair to say. I totally understand that. And by the way, uh, somebody was commenting and they thought that they heard a, a fan. Um, uh, sorry about that. I actually have a space heater on down here because it's really cold in my uh, in my basement studio. So uh, I apologize. I've kicked it away and, and uh, hopefully uh, we're okay. So, um, okay. Well, uh, Klaus, my question then is you are the James Webb uh, Project Scientist at Space Telescope Science Institute. And I realize with big missions like this, with huge missions like Webb, you know, you've got, there's always like a bit of like a hierarchy, almost like a chain of, I don't want to say command, but a chain of accountability. What is your role as the project scientist at Space Telescope? And what is it that you're going to be doing, uh, you know, not just with, but for the, for the Webb mission? Sure, yeah. I don't think of it as much as a hierarchy, maybe it's just that there, there are different components of a, of a complex observatory like this here. Yeah. So different sure. people have responsibility for different parts. So as you know, a Space Telescope, we are the Science and Operations Center of Webb, just as, as we are the Science Center of, of the Hubble Space Telescope. And so we, as an institute, are responsible for you know, the software part of the telescope, the scheduling part of the telescope, the, the connection to the worldwide scientific community, helping them to do the science that they, they want to do. Um, and so my role as, as project scientist for that is that I'm part of a small leader team at, at the Institute uh, who's handling that science and Oper operations center. Um, and and uh, in my role, I can be this advocate for science, right? Make sure that, that the observatory is actually set up in such a way that it can do the science, right? If, if there's you know, you think about a change for how it's scheduled or, or, or how the, the instruments operated. And, and we realize, oh, you know, maybe, you know, we have an option. We can do we can do A or we can do B. B may be better for science. I can advocate for that. So it's, it's a fun job. I mean, I, I sort of you have to be a, a, a jack of all trades in a way, right? But you have sort of the ability to, to poke around and see, you know, if there are issues and try and fix them and try and help out. Well, I know that uh, in order to do that, I mean, and and obviously that right there is no small portfolio. That that's a huge responsibility. That that uh, from everything I can tell, you're obviously just doing with just incredible aplomb. Uh, so I guess then the question is, before that you get to really doing all the science, there's obviously so much more left to go. I mean, we've had these incredible deployments, the unfolding. We've had the slow but steady and you know, deliberate uh, deployment, and or at least by deployment, I should say, pushing out of the mirrors, which will then be phased together to form an image. What other kinds of stuff are on your plate? I mean, don't you have to get into I don't know, like L two today or something, <laughs> and then and then yeah. what happens? Is that like a thing, or is that like, or is that is that the plans changed? <laughs> No, 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 no. That, 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 is, that is certainly a thing. And, and you can see that, that uh, NASA has announced that the expectation is to do what is called MCC2, uh, which is actually the third burn along the way. There was MCC1, right. which, is, which, is, which stands for uh, a mid course correction. Um, so there was MCC1A and B, and now we're doing two. And so this is a final burn that, that allows the observatory to settle into the orbit at L2. And, uh, and we should remember that, that the, the reason for these burns and that, that there are three and that we have to be careful about them is that in order for the observatory to get to L2, um, we have to make sure that we don't overshoot. So I, actually, I have a, I have a if, I, if I may, I have a model of the observatory here. I can show. There oh, we go. 
Yeah. yeah. So, Very nice. So the, well, the point of the burns is that we have the, the rocket sits on the spacecraft bus, which... Ah, there we go. A little bit of a delay. So the, the, the rockets, they sit underneath here. And this is, the, this is the hot part of the observatory. And so this always have to face the sun. And so it means that when, when they make a burn the, uh, from the rockets here, the observatory can only accelerate away from the sun. And so if you make too, if, if you burn too long, if you make, if you give it too much of a push, you can't stop, right? Because if you, if you wanted to stop, you'd have to turn the observatory all the way around. And now you're exposing the, um, the mirror and the instrument to the sun and it would heat them up and it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't, it, it would, it would essentially break the, uh, the observatory. So we just can't do that. So, so you kind of etch toward the, uh, uh, the L2 orbit. Um, and so this is a final burn that just gives it just the last bit of a push uh, so it can settle into, into that orbit. So in, so in that sense, uh, you're basically making just a, a tiny little adjustment, and that seems to be what everything... Uh, and I'm sorry, I was trying to set up another shot here, so I'll go back to this shot here. Uh, let's see. Uh, so it sounds like... It sounds like with each of these efforts, everything is just a tiny little push here, a tiny little adjustment there, uh, very slow, very methodical. And obviously that's very, very intentional, right? Because you mentioned before that if you overshoot, well, what happens if you overshoot L2, for example? I mean, you talked about that would be bad, but can you help us understand why that would be particularly bad? Well, I mean, uh, we wouldn't be able to make the L2 orbit then. And that would mean the end of the mission. Oh. So it's it's it is a mission critical thing to not not overshoot. But you know uh, they know what they're doing, so so we won't we won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you have to be at L two, right? So the, the, one of the I mean one reason, of course, to be at at L two is that it's a very stable orbit. It's far away from this from the uh, Earth and the Moon, so they can't heat the observatory, and so you can always keep the sun shield facing not just the sun but also the Earth and the Moon. Um, uh, uh, and also, it doesn't drift away, right? It, it's, it, it stays in roughly the same at the same distance from the Earth, and it means it's easier to communicate. We have we actually have a fairly high data rate coming down uh, to the Earth. We have to have that because the observatory produces so much data. It's not you know any use of us to take take lots and lots of data if we can't send it back down to Earth. So if it wasn't at L two, but it was some orbit around the Sun and it would drift away from the Earth. Uh, the distances would come too long, um, and we wouldn't be able to have that that data either. So, right. so the observatory is not designed for that at all. Right. So it, it's expecting it's not it's not carrying tremendous amounts of onboard uh, hard drive storage to store like you know terabytes worth of data to be transmitted a few months down the road. It kind of needs to return data. I understand roughly about twice a day on average. Is that your understanding? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Twice a day. And I would say even if it had a big drive, you know, eventually that would fill up anyway, right? And you would have to take a pause, you know, whether you take a right. pause in little little chunks or some big chunks, still you have to take a pause. So I think it's one of the really, really amazing things about this observatory. It's another different to Hubble, right? So Hubble is orbiting the Earth. And that means that half the time uh, Hubble is uh, is in a place where it sees the sun, right? And it's not observing. It has to observe on the essentially on its night side. And so its orbit is one and a half hours long, roughly, and you mm -hmm. know this. Uh, and you can only really observe something half the time, roughly. The web observe, can observe all the time, really 24-7, um, because of that orbit. Um, so it does it does produce a tremendous amount of data, because there's really no break in, in the data taking once we're in science preparation. Right. It's not like, you're, okay, you're just going to... This isn't like with the Kepler Space Telescope, for example, where uh, they did have to orient the spacecraft back to get the antenna to face Earth to do a data dump, and then that was like a period where they couldn't take science data, then they'd have to return back to their field. Basically, Webb just keeps on going, right? And it's almost because you can see here this de depiction of the orbit of the arrangement of the orbit, uh, its antenna is always basically facing Earth at all times, right? That's right, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, on, it's on the model here too, you have the... Uh... It's uh, a bit dark, I guess. Oh, uh, here we go. Uh, Give you the full screen here. Yep. There it is. That's the high gain antenna. Okay. And it's actually on this model here, it happens to be the only thing that is uh, deployable on the model. <laughs> <laughs> so it can, it can move a bit. So uh, 
As always, we get a lot of questions here, and oh my gosh, I uh, we just got a very generous uh, super chat. Um, well, okay, I guess I'm just going to go ahead and get to the super chat here. So uh, this is from uh, Arjan uh, uh, Gorthy, and I'm probably mispronouncing your name, but thank you very much for that generous super chat. Uh, so a question about the temperature readings. The cold side reads minus... To, uh, 211 Celsius, are the instruments going to be cooled down further or is that the operating temp? So as you're answering that question, I can bring up, uh, I can bring up our tracker here, which will actually give us a little bit more of a closer to real time, uh, closer to a real time view and pardon me as I adjust this and I switch to Safari, there we are. So here is our, uh, this is the where is web uh, tracker, which uh, I don't know about you, Klaus, but I think just about everybody that I know of, myself, and especially myself, right, refreshes this like every five minutes. Uh, but you can see up here, we've got our temperature readings. Now, these are given in, uh, in imperial units. Let me switch that over here. So it looks like we're down to about minus 211 on the cold side. This is marked by a, uh, by a letter C. So it's basically saying roughly this is the mirror temperature right now. So to directly ask... Uh, to discuss the question, uh, what then is that the operating temperature, or is there more? Or do we have to get it even colder? Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great question. Uh, just just before I answer that, since you have the page up here, maybe you also want to direct people to the uh, to the metric that says how far we have left to the L two orbit. Oh, it's, uh, it's, uh, what does it say? Three hundred kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> it's very very small distances. When, uh, Look at that. When we're talking space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, for 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 us for us uh, ignorant Americans, uh, that's uh, under two hundred miles. So yeah, basically th that's like the distance. I mean, you could you could drive from here to Philly in less time, <laughs> or less distance rather. So. <laughs> Right, right, right. And, so, and you yeah, can see how that, I don't know, close. for those who have followed, so close, for those who have followed along here, uh, uh, the, 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 the speed with which you count down, the speed that the observatory has been going is, is slowing down over yeah. time. Right, so now it's really slow. Yeah, wow, ju just inching to it. 0 0.2 kilometers a second. That's interesting because, I mean, obviously when that launched, it was something like, seven kilometers a second i mean it was really hauling the mail out there um yeah. so you know what happened why why is it going so slow i mean shouldn't be speeding up since it's free of earth's gravity and all that stuff no you know your gravity reaches infinitely far so it, <laughs> it's still climbing out of that well from from the earth that's why so you you have to throw throw something pretty fast to get it away from earth but as it's moving away it'll slow down and here it's just almost coasting to a stop, almost not quite. So that you make a good point about that, Klaus. It's it's coasting and almost coming to a stop. Now, as I understand it, this is actually quite intentional because in a perfect perfect world, you would stop, boom, right there at L two. But we don't have a perfect world, right? So what, where exactly are you shooting for? Are you trying to shoot to get directly onto L two, or are you trying to? You, you don't want to overshoot, so are you trying to undershoot? No, yeah, yeah. So, so we never go to exactly to L2, which is a, which is a point in space. You can actually see it on the orbit. There. It's, a, it's actually a huge orbit. Uh, if you were to look at the orbit on the sky from the Earth, it's 60 degrees. So we're orbiting mm. L2. So it makes this big sort of ellipse around around L2. Um, and we use L2 just because that big ellipse requires, it requires very little energy. It requires a little bit, but very, otherwise very little energy to stay in that ellipse once in a while we have to do a little burn uh to stay there so so it's, it's not coasting to stop at l2 it's slowing down and and making a little turn you might see, i don't know if, yeah you don't see it on this graphic here but there's some of the other some of the other animations you actually see it make a little bit of a turn and well, it gets to uh, l2 i was gonna say um i think i can cue this up here you know i have these things all queued up and then they then they don't show up they don't they're like they're like children you know or they're they don't they don't perform when you want them to uh but um uh let's see if we can't get this back here no okay i've lost my i've lost my own uh keynote presentation no problem we're just going to change back to uh we're just going to change back to safari once i can find it there we go sorry about that folks uh y you were describing this as being a little bit 
uh, well, actually, uh, one thing I notice is that this is a little bit lopsided, right? In other words, that orbit is not perpendicular uh, to the Earth-Sun, uh, the Sun-Earth L2 line. How come it's tilted by about 30 degrees? That's a good question. I don't know if I have the answer to that. Maybe it's the uh, okay. uh, obliquity of the moon's orbit. But it's a good question. I don't actually have the answer to that. No, that's okay. No worries. I, I, I uh, hey, you know, jack of all trades, but hey, masters of, right? And I know, and I know that feeling. <laughs> so <laughs> that's quite all right. Well, we do have a number of other questions here, and I want to make sure I'm, uh, I'm getting to them here. Let's me. Yeah, go ahead, Let's please. make sure we get back to the temperature question, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The answer is, is, yeah, yeah, we shouldn't forget that one. We got sort of sidetracked. Sorry about that. Uh, no, so, no, so, absolutely, we're still cooling down. Um, and it, we will actually have to cool down a little bit more before we can we can start turning on the instrument. Um, and in particular, one of the instruments, the mid infrared instrument, MIRI, has to be cooled down to 7 Kelvin, 7 degrees Celsius above absolute zero. So that's another uh you know what uh, 65 degrees or so beyond the temperatures that are here so the mirror will never get that cool but that instrument itself has to cool and that takes a long long time uh it actually has to have um, an active cooler so it has a it has a little refrigerator attached to it that helps it cool down that far um so yeah so there's definitely still some extra cooling to be done so there's an extra cooler on board. So the, basically the rest of the instruments, they're all basically benefiting from the passive cooling by that sun shield, right? But then there's that one instrument, Miri, as you said, that's got the refrigeration system on board or the cryostatic uh, cry cryogenic cooler. Now, with other missions like Spitzer and Herschel, you know, they relied on boiling off liquid helium, which has to be super, super cold. So the act of boiling it off carries off heat. Uh, is that the sort of situation that we're faced with here with Webb? It's not going to be limited by its ability to keep itself cool, is it? Right. No, that's a yeah, great question. No, it's it's a, it's like a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. um, right. So you, the refrigerator in your kitchen also it has a gas inside, and there's a pump that compresses that gas and decompresses it, and that that operation allows the gas to pull heat from inside the refrigerator and you know, put it to the outside of the refrigerator, thereby cooling it. And the work you're putting into it is that pump. Uh, so, so the Miri, what's called a cryo cooler, works essentially in the same way. Uh, it does have a gas in it, but it doesn't vent off any gas uh, to space. It's a closed cycle cooler. So it just it just recycles that, that that gas over and over again. And and unless there's a, there's a, 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 an unintentional leak somewhere or or the the um, the mechanism wears out that that'll go for for a long time so Fantastic. there's no lifetime in that, in that sense so uh since we're talking about lifetimes a very common question that comes in uh for this one's from a russia when will it run out of fuel uh, obviously nobody has a crystal ball but it, so far the uh the answer seems to be hmm? what would you what would you estimate yeah. is a good is a reasonable uh time out for fuel well, uh, so we know that we have we have more fuel than we hoped for. Uh, the launch of the Ariane 5 rocket was very precise, right? And so it, again, it goes back to this, uh, this requirement we have to not overshoot L2. Yeah, so so uh, the, the Ariane 5 rocket gave, was not intended to give it all the speed, to give the observatory all the velocity that it needed to get there because you know, rockets are they're a little uncertain, right? You don't want to have that risk that that you just you go too fast. So, so it's really on. It was under, um, uh, sort of under burning that that rocket. But they they made a very very precise insertion from Ariane five, and it means that we re we needed less fuel to do these mid course correction burns, and that leaves a lot of fuel available uh, for the mission lifetime when we have to do these tiny little burns to keep it uh, in the L two orbit. Um, and so the, the, the requirement was to, to launch with enough fuel for at least 10 years of operations. Now we know we have significantly more than that. There's a, there's a lot available there. Uh, now, uh, we, we're, we're hesitant saying how many years that is because we, we don't know uh, exactly how many times we have to make that, make those station keeping mm -hmm. burns uh, out at L2. Um, we don't know exactly how the, right, the, the another thing is that the solar radiation, the light from the sun pushes on the sun shield and it tries to turn, it tries to turn the uh, the observatory. 
um, it, it sure. pushes on pushes on the sun shield and tries to turn it. So that there are reaction wheels inside here that 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 take up some of that some of that rotation, and, and uh, eventually this, those reaction wheels can wheels can spin any any faster. And what that means is that we have to make a burn to spin them down. So exactly how much we need of that, we don't know. And so until we we have been in orbit for a little bit longer, uh, we we won't know um, how much is ultimately is, is available. But it, it it looks really good. Is the message? So uh, so we've been hearing uh, about oh possibly twenty years as you as you also indicated. Uh, but again, no one has a crystal ball. But so far, the prognosis is looking really good. Uh, so congratulations, and uh, also a huge thanks to uh, Arion. Uh, Spas and Isa for that really sweet launch have just seemed to go so well. Uh, so we have a few, <laughs> a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to try to see if I can't uh, uh, bring up uh, some of these. Uh, so African Lion of, of generous super chat, uh, five dollars. Uh, thank you for the coverage. The burn starts at two p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I don't know. Are they? They're not. I mean, I know that they are, that this is a burn that's commanded from the ground, right? So they'll basically do it when they're ready, right? That, that That's right. It's planned for two. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sitting right here, so I can't actually see what they're doing. <laughs> uh, but there is, a, there is, of course, a press conference. I think it starts at three, uh, or there's a, there's a science discussion at three, and then there's a press conference at four or something like that. Mm -hmm. um so i would recommend tune into that and they will give you the uh, the real deal of what's going on great uh we also have another uh generous super chat from jeff curtis uh how will you know when jwst's arrived I, I think that's an interesting question uh you know how do we know that we've actually gotten uh two l2 is there some sort of a confirmation signal that they're that they're waiting on let me try to fast forward here to this bit of the uh video i think it's kind of relevant to what we're talking about so what's your understanding uh how how do you think they're going to know that well, we know where the observatory is. I mean, there are various ways of, of knowing that. I mean, for one, like a very, very simple way uh, is that we uh, that we're in contact with it most of the time or all the time at the moment um, and uh, uh, through the deep space network. And, and we just know how, you know, radio signals from the observatory take a certain amount of time to get here by the speed of light. So we mm -hmm. know exactly how far away it is. It's called ranging. Um, and so we know where it is and we know, we know where, you know, the, the moon and the earth and the sun, we know the exact masses. So, so we actually know, know very, very exactly and very precisely where it is compared to, to L2. So I guess once, once, uh, they can see that, okay, from the ranging data, uh, and, and by ranging, we're talking about radio signals, uh, different antennae dishes looking at web and they're getting different getting slightly different angles and they can actually work out the distance. I suppose once they understand that Webb is now returning backward a little bit, it's following the predicted path of the orbit and that's how they know that they've successfully made orbit. Well, yeah, Maybe. and also, I mean, just, you, 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 essentially it's a ping, right? I mean, you, mm -hmm. you send a signal out there, you get a signal back and you can measure how long it takes. Right, right, exactly. And uh, so Don was asking, is, is the burn just to stabilize? Well, would you characterize it as stabilization, or would you characterize it as really fundamentally altering its its uh, current trajectory? Yeah, no, no, it's fundamentally altering its trajectory. It is an mm -hmm. insertion, right? That's where we go back right. to when you, if you look at the orbit. It's kind of if it were con would continue in the trajectory it has right now, it would just go straight past past this this, this elliptical orbit. But it turns around. It, it almost does like a ninety degree, mm -hmm. and then it gets into the elliptical. So yeah, that, I think that turn is, is the insertion. Yeah, I think I've got a, uh, a schematic of that uh, right here. Well, actually, yeah, we have it right here. So that's what you see. Uh, and, and it's also kind of worth noting that if you look at this illustration, uh, you know, Webb did not, and maybe this uh, illustration can be taken with a certain grain of salt, but um, Webb did not just go out on a straight line to L2. It actually kind of launched away from it towards it, but also kind of moving away from it until it finally just falls into l2 so that burn basically stops the outward progression and it just falls into that uh l2 orbit i guess that's right that's right yeah yeah the turn close to the earth is due to the earth's gravity okay it's cool. still strong enough that it sort of it's a little bit of a turn around the Earth. Oh, of course right it's just like anytime you launch a rocket you go up and you know gravity's pulling trying to pull you back down uh, so raj was asking right. how come large solar sails that are light and low mass are not used on web well actually i think there's an argument to be made that 
there is a large solar sail on web, right? Yeah, it works as a solar sail, but it's unintentional. I mean, it would be better if it didn't. <laughs> uh, but but yeah, but but I, I think maybe the, the the question is about how why don't you use that instead of uh, instead of a rocket burn? No, oh, to yeah. keep it at L two. But it is because the, the the sun shield always has to face the sun, so mm-hmm. the push goes in the same direction. Of course, and, right. and that's you know that's not what you want. Right. Uh, so Jeff was asking, is this a live view from Hubble? Uh, no, no, this is just a schematic here. Uh, Hubble really doesn't look at web uh, just because if it tried to, it would just see a point of light. And we can see that from plenty of telescopes on the ground. But in a real sense, though, we have something better than uh, we've got something better than than Hubble. We have that radio uh, communication with web. Uh, so, uh, in fact, let me... Um, let me see if I can find uh, this page here. Uh, I had it. Well, it's one of those things where I had it and then I lost it again. But it's basically there's a really nice uh, visualization of the uh, of all the of the deep space network uh, making direct communication uh, with web. So I'm going to bring up the shot oh, yeah. over here, and I'll uh, I'll just see if I can uh, find that image. Uh, let's see, uh, deep space network live well you know it's one of those things where once i find it you know ah here we are yeah so let's go ahead and i'll return over to here a little bit of real-time production everybody hope you don't mind uh but i knew the risks when i put on the uniform so anyway uh, so here we are looking at a, uh, a, well, this is literally a live shot. So uh, just to kind of, can you walk us through what it is we're looking at here, Klaus? We have a couple of different uh, screens here. We have a couple different rows. And we looks like we have three different locations. So can you tell us about what this is what this is uh, all about? Yeah, I mean, so, so the Deep Space Network is a network of radio telescopes that mm-hmm. NASA uses to communicate with deep space probes like web right but also the ones that visit the planets um and they're they're distributed around the earth because you know you always have to have one that can see the observatory at any given time it's interesting so so when you have something in l2 right on, uh, uh, so on the other side of the earth from the sun it means that if you go out at midnight l2 will be up will be straight up right mm. And uh, if you're at noon, right, it'll be, it, you'll have to see through the Earth. <laughs> um, so you can't do this with one antenna. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, we're flipping be- between three. Right? There's one in Madrid in Spain. There's one in Goldstone here in the United States. And then there's one in Canberra in Australia. Um, and you can, this is a great side, right? Because you can see, because you can see which one is actually com- actively communicating. I was going to say, we have, it looks like Madrid is talking uh, with Webb at the moment. Uh, let's see if we can, so if I click on, if I click on Madrid, uh, can I, if I click on that? Yeah, here we are. Uh, here is a, well, I believe this is a live shot actually, uh, looking down at the, uh, yeah, I think that's what this is supposed to be. I think this is supposed to be a live shot because it should be nighttime over there. So yeah. 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 And it has to be, as I mentioned, right. It has to be nighttime, right. You can't do Mm -hmm. it here because we're in the, in the, in the, in the U S West East coast here, we're in the middle of the day. The right. two wouldn't be up, wouldn't be visible from an antenna. It's it's so it's early in the evening in in Europe. So uh, I can't see. Maybe you can scroll down, but the elevation should be quite low. Uh, the elevation, uh, yeah, they're they're down at about uh, twenty seven degrees. Uh, or right, I'm right. sorry, that yeah, twenty seven degrees uh, latitude. So yeah, yeah. So they probably just picked it up recently, and then they're going to mm-hmm. track it across the sky. Fantastic. So they're just going to track it off across the sky, and then they're going to hand it off to uh, to Goldstone, who then hands it off to Canberra. So it's kind of fun to be able to watch this, and this is another one of these uh, websites that I can just sort of like stare at all day. You know. So, uh, Alex, thank you yeah. so much for the super chat, and I just wanted to say how happy I am to see all the people from around the world looking forward to this. It's going to be awesome all for all of us. I agree with you, Alex. I, I really do think that this is like just humanity at its best. You know what I mean? Like how, how great is that? So, uh, so thank you. Um, so will the speed, so this brings up a new question. Uh, will the speed go to zero relative to earth after the burn? I guess not really. I guess once it's there, it's constantly going to be approaching and then moving away from earth. Right. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, it's not moving away from earth, but it, it'll be the, it's, so if, 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 the, if, the, if the question is, and you can see it on the schematic here, uh, if the question is if it's just the velocity vector relative to the Earth, it is going to be very, very small. 
but you can see that there's still a, there's still a little bit of an it's not in that plane as you mentioned earlier it's not perpendicular to the plane between the, uh, the Earth. And the sometimes it's a little bit farther away, sometimes a little bit closer, sometimes a little bit farther away. Uh, so then uh, uh, Bifibi, uh asked, how long is the insertion window? Uh, are there mechanisms in place to ensure the insertion burn does not happen too late? I think it's a fairly generous window, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. This one is not as time critical as, as MCC 1, 1A mm -hmm. and 1B. They were much more time critical. So, so if you wait, uh, it's just it's going to be more expensive in, in the fuel you need. Um, but you, there's quite a long window. So, so there, there will be time if, if it wasn't today. Fantastic. Uh, so uh, Jan asked, uh, can we track and image it? Asking for a friend, uh, tell your friend, yes, you, you can track and image it. It's OK. <laughs> All right, so now we are getting I, really. I think it's uh, I think it's fantastic. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the. Maybe you've talked about that already. All the people who post little videos of the observatory oh. that they have taken with their backyard telescope. I think I've seen people even now, like very recently, and so we're basically adult too. So it's not going to get dimmer than it is now. Right. Uh, people have done it with like an eight-inch telescope. No, no problem. So that I, <laughs> I think that's fantastic. I mean, we hadn't predicted that people would do that. I mean, maybe in hindsight, it's obvious. But yeah. uh, awesome to see that people are doing. It. Uh, yeah, and and Chad, uh, I I know you're asking what size telescope would one need to see? Uh, Webb is more than just one or two pixels. Um, it would have to be very very large. Uh, there's no question about it. it would have to be. Uh, well, I know that Hubble would basically reveal it as like a a, a pixel. Uh, and that's a 2.4 meter telescope. I haven't done the math on this myself, but apparently it's got to be a very nice big telescope, uh, bigger than 2.4 yeah. meters. We have done we have done the math for that. Yeah, it's only a few milliarc seconds. So yeah, so you need something uh, more than 10 times the size of Hubble. Uh, so 240. Space. Yeah. So there you go. About 240 meters, mm -hmm. preferably located in space. <laughs> which is kind of weird to think about because you know it hubble sees these amazing things from so far away etc cetera, etc cetera. but yeah at the same time you know angular size matters you know i mean how large it is on the sky is is everything uh so is there so uh samzi asked is there an impression of what images are expected uh, so I guess impression, you could perhaps interpret that a couple of ways, perhaps a simulation, or do you have some idea of what you're expecting to see image quality wise? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, so we should remember that um, the, the the wavelengths that Webb is operating at are predominantly infrared, but there is some overlap with Hubble. Um, right? So Hubble operates a little bit in the, in the infrared as well. Um, it's just that with web covers, you know, infrared wavelength, infrared colors that that goes way beyond what what, uh, what Hubble did. Um, but then in in that range, we have uh, images from the Spitzer Space Telescope, for example. So relative to to Hubble at the near infrared wavelength, we should get uh, uh, you know similar kind of images, but you know two or three times higher resolution. Spitzer, we would get, you know. Uh, see the same kind of structure, but there we have 10 times the spatial resolution. Um, so, so we do know a little bit of, of what we'll see, but there's also a big, what we, uh, what we call discovery space, because in the infrared, web is so much more sensitive, not just the, the resolution, right? It's so much more sensitive than anything has been there before, including Spitzer. That we can see things that are 50 or 100 times fainter. And so at some level, you know, the really bright things we have, I think we have an idea of what they will look like, but you know, whatever is, is lurking there in the shadows, that's faint, uh, that we just haven't had the opportunity to see before. I think that, that's very, those are very hard to, to predict. And, and perhaps those are the things that I'm looking most forward to see, just, you know, as, as discovery, what's there. You know, as soon as we, we take the first images, we'll see. Well, I've seen some uh, simulated images and, uh, and, you know, they're simulations, but they're just really good for comparison and you just it's so exciting to see what what it uh is uh calculated to do and then there's what's calculated to do and then there's what it will do uh but i think uh zoltan says yeah uh, if you can read this yeah i think that would be a good first image you know um and i've also seen the gag you know uh you know remove before flight you know spelled in reverse that's another uh <laughs> um the uh 
the question uh well some other actually there was a question that came up it was it was in the form of a super chat i'd like to uh, return to it so first of all thank you skip very much for the super chat uh for navigation of web are newtonian mechanics sufficient or do the engineers plan its position with relativistic pre precision wow i haven't gotten that before i i I don't know the answer to that question. I would think it would be, uh, I think they don't need relativistic out there, but I, I'm not sure. I, so they I, do for GPS. Yeah, yeah for I, GPS, I absolutely. So. Uh, I, I think they can get away with, with Newton in the driver's seat because you do have such a wide latitude latitude you know you have there's a range uh the orbit that you see around l2 well actually we can just go to this uh schematic here uh we'll go back to the schematic um but what yeah. we see also for, for it, gps right uh, go ahead i was gonna say what we see here it's not just one can it's not perfectly looping back on itself it's precessing and uh it's librating around l2 so i would think that they could probably get away with newton but it, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for GPS, you 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 need the relativistic treatment because it's dependent right. on on time, on timing, right? And and as we know, time is different in a gravitational field. So time is a little different in low Earth orbit than it is on on the ground because you're a little bit you know, big, a little bit up in the gravity field. So well, that, you know, that's the reason GPS does it. So it's very very precise timing. We don't need that for for web. Sure. And besides, time is an illusion. Lunchtime doubly so, which is why we're doing this at lunch. Uh, the uh, and, uh, <laughs> Carolus, thank you very kindly for the super chat. Really do appreciate that. Uh, and then another question that's been that's often asked is, can it be ripped off by a meteorite? So I know micrometeoroid damage is a question that a lot of people ask about. What is your understanding of how Webb is going to weather uh, the environment out there? Yeah, no, that, that, that's another good question. So the whole observatory is designed to be to be resistant to uh, micrometeorite impact in many different ways. Obviously, if it gets hit by something big, you know, that, 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 that's it. But that's very unlikely. So we're talking about tiny little tiny little things that they go fast enough that they will they will make a hole in something. Um, so there's one reason that the, the it's not the only reason. It's one reason that the a sun shield is five layers so if something goes goes through it and makes a hole through it's very unlikely that because they will, everything will come in at some kind of angle it's very unlikely that 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 you'll see light going all the way through all those five holes for example uh, critical components critical electronics those are those are shielded with with material that can withstand the impact of, uh, of a micrometeorite without you know going through a chip or something like that Fantastic. So yeah, so it sounds like it's able to withstand some damage without losing any science, any without significantly losing science capabilities. Um, obviously, if something really did, my understanding, and 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 you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I probably am, but I know the question that gets asked a lot is, well, there are these, there's these 18 mirror segments that make up the primary. What if like a really big rock comes in and smashes one to bits, and it's or it it just can't be used? My understanding is that in that sort of like worst case scenario they could sort of point it away a little bit so it's no longer in the i don't know if it can point it out of the focal plane but they could they could also like defocus it or detune it so that it no longer contributes to the image is that is that anything like real as far as you know yeah yeah yeah. No, you you you, you can do that um i don't think the scenario is it getting hit by a rock but more that you know, it, it has these actuators behind each, each mirror segment has seven actuators that move it. Mm -hmm. um, and so if, if something dramatic happened to those, uh, uh, indeed, you could you could move it out of the way. I mean, you, you will change the like the, the, the point spread function, the way a, a star looks. Uh, you would change the way that it looks. Maybe it'll look a little odd, mm -hmm. but you'd still be able to do lots and lots of science. You'd still be able to collect most of the light. Cool. Yeah. So, and, and also I think it's worth remembering that, um, <laughs> well, I know that we're very excited about a, the, the prospect of a 20 year web mission, but even if web could somehow last 30 years, you know, that's a really short amount of time. If like, you really have to, it takes time. Like web is really tiny basically is what it comes down to. Web is very tiny and space is very, very big. So the chances of something large striking web within that 30 year lifetime is already kind of on the low end. And I think that's partly because it is at L2. Uh, the fact is, is that we're not putting this in low earth orbit, which is very riddled, which is just riddled with all kinds of debris. 
Right, right. We should also remember that that um, we have other spacecraft out there that have been functioning for a very long time. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, we've had uh, you know things like Voyager and Pioneer. Right. The Vo Voyager is still functioning. Uh, uh, you know they were uh, they've been going for more than forty years. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's not very likely that you get hit by something big, but it's the small thing. So. Exactly. Uh, so Patislav, uh, a generous super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a half second. There is half a second delay. Can it cause a correction of correction, etc.? Or maybe is there a manual trigger of some algorithm? I'm afraid I don't fully understand the question, but I did want to thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, do you? Uh, I guess are we talking about the fact that there is like about a five second delay between? Earth and web right now because of the light travel time and there's really nothing that you can do about that right it's just a fact of physics at this point yes yeah no that, that, that that's right yeah, so, so it's a 10 second round trip time so you mm -hmm. send the command up there you have to wait 10 seconds before you you know if the uh, the spacecraft uh, responded to it um, in, in, in normal science operations we, we're not going to command it all the time like this by the way right? mm -hmm. it, it is actually robotic you send up a script um, and it runs the, the script on its own. And if, uh, as can happen, this happens with Hubble too, right? That it tries to do an observation of something and that observation fails for some reason. Um, can be many reasons for that. You know, not anything dramatic. It's just that ha just happens. You can't do the observation of, of what it was trying to do. Web will is smart enough that it will just skip to the next one in the plan on its own. That's how it's designed. So, so we don't have to be in, in contact with it all the time doing normal operations. Yeah, and I, and that's a that's a really good point. I mean, we are talking about a uh, we're talking about a robot, as you said. It's a script. It just follows the observations, and Web is not really designed to just like stop what it's doing on a dime and go over there really quick because a star exploded. I mean, there are going to be opportunities where they're literally called target of opportunity programs, right? Uh, where web could pivot, but even then, it, it's not as simple as just stop what you're doing and do this. Correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah. There, there's definitely need time to create that script, that, that observing script, and send it up to the observatory. Uh, and then, of course, you if 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 you have to do this very fast, you're going to disrupt all the things that were planned. Um, and so the plans are, are made uh, in two week chunks. Uh, those observing scripts. Um, so what we say is, if if you need to react to something, a supernova or something like that, and you 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 don't you don't need to react within two weeks, it's not a problem for us because it'll just go in the next plan. But if it's less than that, you're going to disrupt this whole plan of all these other observations that are also exciting, and that's when you you have to look at it and say, is it worth it? This one thing that is very exciting, but is it is it is it uh, more important than doing this thing we'd already planned? So then it becomes a conversation. I know that people have been really excited as we were talking, and I just scrolled up, and uh, at least according to this uh, website, we are there uh, at L2, at least oh, yeah. according to the website. So, um, uh, yay, L2, everybody, L2. Okay. Have a drink, yay. I think. I, uh, can we can we say that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I know that you're I know that you're at home, but it sounds like. Uh, well, I'm not hearing anything that it, I'm not hearing anybody say it didn't work. Uh, I'm, you know, got my Twitter on and all that kind of stuff. So I guess we're in good shape. Yes. Um, I, I honestly, I don't know. I'm not. I'm yeah. not following it. So yeah. then, you know, you've got to tune into the press conference, and they they will tell you. Um, I don't think you should rely too much on their website. To yeah, I, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I think it's sort of like, well, you know, is that actually? I think is very uh, interesting. It it it. It tells us something that uh, I know that I know that I think a lot of folks were expecting to see like web like make this big burn and do like this huge alley oop to get into L two, but it's actually very quiescent and and a very uh, I don't want to call it you know gentle, but you know what I mean. Like this is a really 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 big orbit. I mean the orbital radius around L two is larger than the moon's orbit around Earth. It's a very big orbit, and and so think about that for a second. Like if you were going to orbit Earth at the same distance that Webb is orbiting L two, you're not going to like make like this hard turn or do something very dramatically. It's going to be just a burn, and and then you just fall into it very gradually. Correct? 
Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is meant to be a nice, quiet, stable, cold, yeah. uneventful orbit. So it's doing what it's designed to do. Yeah. So a very common question that gets asked here, and Cyberpunk asked it, uh, and I think it's also I think it's a fun one to talk about is will it repl replicate Hubble's deep field image? Ah. So now you being the project scientist, you may have I don't want to say any say in that, but you may have some involvement in that, right? Um. Well, I, I'm not involved in that observation okay. uh, myself, but uh, we know very well what is going to happen in the uh, in the first year of, of science. And indeed, um, the, the, you know, the, some of the instrument teams have put their time into observing the Hubble Deep Field, um, among many others, by the way. Um, and the, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field was observed over the course of many days. I forget how many, 10 days, something like that of the total time just staring at that place. Uh, so that, that would be replicated by Webb and just in terms of sensitivity in a couple hours in the wavelengths where in the filters that you overlap with, with Hubble. And that, then they go amazing. beyond that. Right? And they go beyond that. So that's already in the plans, right? They, they go beyond at the same wavelength and they, they add all these other infrared wavelengths to see the most distant galaxies, the ones that whose light is redshifted out of the, uh, the Hubble ring. That's so, so yeah, it, it goes very heavy. It just gets done again. Yeah. That that's the part that that I think just blows my mind. Like, oh, it took it took uh, it took Hubble uh, two weeks to get the deep field, and Webb's gonna be like, yeah, okay, here we go, a couple hours. There, what else would you like me to do? You know, um, but uh, but that just speaks to just how incredibly mind-bogglingly sensitive it is. I, de I definitely want to uh, say thanks to. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 3, 7, 3, 0, 4. I want to ask, will, will James Webb always be pointing in the same direction as the schematic is showing as a rate, uh, or can it rotate? What is the limitation? Actually, funny should, funny should ask, because um, I do have a little animation here that I think can help us to, and perhaps you could speak to this uh, a little bit, uh, Klaus. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, yeah. whoops. Uh, well, I had it, and then I lost it. Uh, so anyway... Yeah, so this is where I got to go back to Safari, and then I got to come back to Keynote. Uh, let's bring up the actual. Okay, so as I understand it, Web does not have the ability to look anywhere it wants to, right? But it still nevertheless sees the entire sky over the course of a year, right? That's right, that's right. And, and it's actually even at one given time, it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, so it can rotate as long as these the, the sun shield is always facing the sun, right? So there is an axis that can rotate, so it kind of can cover a, a donut, sort of a donut shape on the sky. And I think this this animation will show that. Mm -hmm. It turns out it's about 39% of the sky at any given time that you can reach. And wow. then as the whole thing orbits around the sun in the course of a year, you will have at least two opportunities during that year as you see, there we go. That's the uh, yeah. that's the field of regard at any given time. It turns out right. to be thirty nine percent. So it's kind of looking at like a and strip here, a year, like a strip. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You you sit on the inside of a donut, and you have. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and then during the course of a year, it sort of scans through the whole sky. So you get an opportunity to observe any given target at least twice during that year. So usually there's like six months between. You can get it now, or uh, or you can get it in six months, roughly. Great. Uh, so Wayne, Wayne uh, Sawchuck was asking, and actually we'll just go ahead and let this animation play out because I think this is really uh, just a, a, a beautiful illustration uh, that how Webb sees. One, one thing that I know that a lot of folks, and myself included, uh, I had the misunderstanding that, oh, okay, the telescope would be able to point independent of the heat shield. But I can actually, now under now that I've had a chance to think a little bit more about how Webb's put together, being able to move the telescope part independent of heat shield, that would require motors and things that generate a lot of heat and that stuff could break. And I could see that being a bit of a bad idea, <laughs> right? Or at least a very yeah, difficult yeah, thing to implement. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's not independently articulated as they say. Yeah, um, exactly. There, there, yeah. There may be designs like that in the future. I mean, it's, this is mm -hmm. something to, to think about. I mean, it, this is, this is of course pure speculation, but, but now that, that we, we have demonstrated that we can deploy a telescope like this in space, like I said, all these things that have never been done before, now they're done. 
that makes a huge difference in NASA's planning and any kind of planning in spacecraft. Once you've demonstrated it in space, it's, there's a lot less of a barrier for somebody to go and say, oh, let's do it again. People say, well, we already did it. We know the technology now. Right. Um, and then you can add new technologies on top of that. So for, for future space telescopes, who knows? So, Wayne, uh, and thank you very much for the uh, super chat, Wayne. Uh, what force holds Webb in orbit around L2, given that there is no mass there to supply a gravitational force as there is around a planet or a moon, etc.? Uh, it's funny, I'm actually working on a video about this, but uh, but uh, did you want to take a shot at this, Klaus? Or I could show some graphics that I put together to kind of help to explain it, if, if you want. That's up to you. Um, sure, I mean... I mean, I can give the, the, the very short answer is that there's gravity everywhere in space. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, gravity's reach is, is infinite. And, and what, what you get from the L2 orbit is that it stays there because you have the combined gravity of both the sun and the earth. Right? So if it was orbiting the sun there uh, and the earth wasn't around, it would actually orbit the sun a little slower. So that, that's how gravity works. It's called a Keplerian orbit. Uh -huh. If you only have those two bodies, you have the sun and the spacecraft itself, the speed that it orbits with gets slower and slower the farther you get away. So the fact that the Earth is there as well to add its gravity to that of the sun allows the spacecraft to orbit a little faster than it otherwise would have, and so it can stay sort of more or less locked with the orbit of the Earth. Yeah, that's the a special property of the L2 orbit. Right. So the and and this is only this, by the way, is only only possible uh, because the mass of Webb is negligible compared to the mass of the Sun and Earth. If this were if Webb were like I don't know Jupiter, well, you know that's gonna that's gonna do something very different, right? But because Webb's mass is negligible, it doesn't generate enough of its own gravity to phrase it that way. Uh, so the yeah, it just basically just gets swung around, kind of like tying a tying a ball on a, to a string, tying a string around a ball, and then flinging the string around. The ball just goes. Uh, so uh, Andre uh, asked, uh, "Hello, uh, and thank you very much for the super chat. Thank you so much. Hello. When when will Webb get some information about solar system Trappist one, uh, the Trappist one solar uh, Trappist one exoplanetary system, and what do you think about exoplanets on that system? Can we live there?" Hmm. So Trappist One is that is that sort of your thing, or is that uh, are you an exoplanet guy, Klaus? Or uh, I'm sort of an exoplanet guy. I study the uh, formation of exoplanets, hmm. um, so the very early phases of that. But but I'm happy to talk about uh, about Trappist One. It is it is certainly way up there in my f favorite exoplanetary systems. And I think that's true for for a lot of us. So just just to know that 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 the Trappist One is an is an exoplanetary system that, that has at least seven planets in it, but three of them are in the Goldilocks zone, uh, where where temperatures on those planets might be uh, uh, appropriate for having liquid water on them, um, and so you know they may be habitable for that reason. There are many other reasons they may not be, but we don't know the answers to that. And there are several programs. In the, in the first year web that will that will observe those Trappist one planets and that's just a very very basic question that we're trying to answer in uh, very early on and that is whether they even have atmospheres or not um, Trappist one the star of Trappist one is, uh, is is much smaller than the Sun it's a red dwarf star these red dwarf stars uh, have some unhealthy properties they have enormous stellar flares right so the sun has stellar flares too um and they can cause cause trouble on the earth uh too but but the, the ones around red, red dwarf stars are much bigger and so a lot of folks say that because it has these giant flares that those tend to strip off the atmospheres of their planets um and so there's an outstanding question of whether the trappist one planets even though they're in the right orbit whether they have atmospheres that could host life so Webb is going to go out and look at those those very important planets that, that are in the area around Trappist-1 and see if they have atmospheres. We can make that mission and basically answer that sort of yes-no question uh, right off the bat. And then the, the second part of that question, of course, is what are those atmospheres made of? Uh, but then that, that, that comes later. I think the, uh, the, the that's probably the most... Uh... You know, I think the reason why it's captured the imagination of so many people is just because you are looking at so many planets uh earth-sized planets that are just huddled 
right there next to their parent star. And not for nothing, but I mean, just look how many of them seem to be within uh, that star's habitable zone. So, yeah, it's, uh, on the one hand, that, that the red dwarf is the great big unknown in this equation. Uh, you know, can the, does the red dwarf uh, per, you know, preclude life or make it that much harder for life? Uh, don't really know. Um, so uh, just a couple of other questions here to uh, Oto asked, and thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, can we predict the L2 orbit of the web with high accuracy for weeks to come? I understand that they basically look at it for about 19 days and then they do a, a, a correction burn about every 21 days. Is that your understanding or is it something else? Uh, yeah, and I, uh, it, it, it's about right. And, um, uh, and then, of course, they'll, they'll look at the performance over time. Again, there, there's some uncertainties in, 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 in how the actual performance will be of the orbit. Um, and so I'm sure there's going to be tweaks to this that timeline, but it, it's, it's roughly right. Very cool. Uh, so another question that uh, we had is, uh, in, again, thank you very much for the super chat. <laughs> is uh, NASA or ESA planning to donate any telescope time to students or countries that are not part of their regular scientific community? Hmm. Um, yeah, good question. So I, I did two two aspects of it. So Webb is an open skies observatory, so it means that anybody can can apply for time. Anybody in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't even strictly have to have an affiliation anywhere. Um, if you if you have a good idea, if you can write a good proposal, uh, in principle, you can be awarded time in the observatory, no matter where you are. Uh, but you have to have a good proposal, of course, and you have to know what, what you're doing. Um, there's no plans to donate time to schools, uh, things like that at this time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe that Hubble has ever done that. I, the, Hubble did have, uh, they, they, they did this on at least three or four or three two to three different occasions but they had an amateur hour so to speak they allowed they invited the amateur uh astronomy community to submit proposals and they actually carried out a few of those observations you know uh i mean they were good enough they were like yeah this is, this is definitely worth doing but they weren't but the individual observers were were amateurs they were not affiliated with an institution they you know um i guess though one thing that one thing that since has happened uh, with Hubble and is happening with Webb is that all of the proposals that are submitted are double blind, which means that they're anonymous, which means that yes, you can write a proposal and if it's good, it will be accepted. Right? I mean, that's right. Yeah. yeah. The review panel don't know who you are. Yeah, exactly. And you're not allowed to reveal it in your proposal. Yeah. Uh, so actually, would throw out a proposal if you say who you are in the proposal. Right. If you say if you say who you are, you're out. That <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have another super chat from Norman Wright. So please talk about the cryocoolers and 40k helium inversion uh, uh, temperature. Uh, cryocooler won't work unless it's working. I'm sorry. Uh, working fluid less than 40 Kelvin. Uh, so I guess he's making the observation that the cryocooler that we talked about with the one instrument, Miri can't even operate until we're below 40 kelvin is that right yeah yeah and that, and that's true for a lot of systems right they don't get turned on until we're we're at some low level of temperature unfortunately we know that we can passively cool to 40 kelvin mm -hmm. uh, just from the sun shield right okay great uh so this is an interesting question that comes also in the form of a super chat i'm trying to prioritize the super chats kind of there's so many other questions i know you don't have to at pay pay for a super chat but since these folks are putting money out there, I want to make sure I get to them. Uh, so how does Webb focus, and thank you, Jason, very much for the Super Chat. How does Webb focus on one point in space while it's moving around in orbit? That's, always, that's a question that's always fascinated me. I mean, the thing is traveling, it's moving, and it's supposed to be taking... I mean, I know that if I'm taking a picture out of my car window as I'm driving as I'm riding as a passenger safely seatbelted, and I try to take a picture, I'm going to get a blurry image. How does Webb do it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there, 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 are, there are a number of things, a number of, of uh, elements in that system. Uh, one is that uh, that Webb has reaction wheels, just like uh, like Hubble does, right? So, so it's it's equivalent to you know the experiment where you you take a bicycle wheel and you spin it really fast, and it it it, it becomes hard to turn that wheel. The wheel will try to turn you. You can't turn the wheel because it's spinning uh, due to conservation of angular momentum. So it uses wheels like that. To, to turn to slew the telescope. Um, in, in addition to that, any small vibrations that are there um, can also be um, 
corrected for using uh, what's called a fine steering mirror. So it's part of the whole telescope. Like once the, the light is, is reflected by the primary, goes into the secondary, as a tertiary mirror um, yeah, inside, uh, you know, a little bit behind the primary mirror. And then there's a, there's a fourth element, which is called a, a fine steering mirror, which is like a flat mirror. And that flat mirror can tip and tilt. So it can move in this direction, it can move in this direction. And, and that can move very quickly and can compensate for any small, uh, any small vibrations. Um, so there are those two elements in the system that allows the observatory to point to, you know, and with an accuracy over a long time to a few milli seconds. So it's a combination it's of... Roughly, yeah. Oh, go ahead. So it's a combination of, of very precise uh, pointing control as well as image stabilization. Yeah. Wow, fantastic, yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, thank you, Alex. Uh, Instantaneous became famous, so grateful dead book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a, that, That's a whole other discussion about uh, my late mother, but she raised me right. Yeah, so, um, so Sidrith was asking, can Webb photograph the black hole in our galaxy? I think we're talking about maybe Sagittarius A-star. Mm -hmm. um, well, so the short answer is, is no. We don't have the uh, spatial resolution to to get a, a resolved image of that black hole in the center of, of our galaxy. I don't I, I don't remember how small it is, but it's a lot smaller than what, what we can do. But um, the, there are web programs that will study that, that galactic center region um, and, and reveal a lot of new things about that black hole that we didn't know before, even though we can't resolve the black hole area itself. Um, the galactic center, right, because we're looking through the plane of our galaxy, our galaxy is full of dust and invisible light. We just can't see the galactic sensor because of all that dust. So web, the web's infrared capabilities allows us to see right through all that dust. And, and we can measure uh, to high precision the movement of stars in the, near that black hole. We can see how they orbit the black hole. Um, and we can, we can understand, you know, get a much better understanding for the radiation environment, you know, what, what is really going on in, in, in the in sort of, I would say in the, in, the, in the suburbs of the black hole region. And so there are programs that will do that. Uh, so the, uh, there's a very interesting question that I just uh, noted here. Uh, and this came from Ethan. Uh, if the universe is an ever-expanding balloon, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not laughing at you, Ethan. I think it, I, I, I know where you're headed with this question. It's like, yeah, you know. Uh, will looking back 13 and a half billion years limit Boy, I wish it wouldn't disappear me quite that quickly. Uh, will limit in the sky where Webb can look. So, would there be a limitation just due to the universe's expansion of where in the sky it can be? Yeah, yeah. No, um, the answer is uh, the short answer is is, is no, uh, not not because of the expansion of the universe. This is sort of a property of the universe. Is that of course we do we we are not actually on the surface of a balloon. Um, so no matter where you look, which direction you look in the universe on large enough scale, it all looks the same. It's, it's, it's a fundamental principle of cosmology. Uh, so in that, that sense, it doesn't matter which direction you look, you can, you can see roughly speaking, uh, down, uh, you know, back to the same age of the universe. Uh, of course there may be something else in the way, right? So, so it's a, it's a web can see through dust and can see through things, but you know, I, I'm, it still is not great to try and look through the plane of our own galaxy uh, if you want to understand the galaxies at the edge of the universe. I imagine I don't think anybody's trying to do that. So there might be something else in the way, but but not because of the, uh, the expansion, not because of cosmology. Oh, fair enough. Uh, so another question uh, that came through. Oh, okay, well, uh, all right. <laughs> just just to get the question out of the way, since I get asked this a lot, uh, where can I buy one of those? Uh, where can I buy one of those super cool black web telescope shirts? Yeah. So where do we get one of those web shirts, uh, uh, Klaus? Well, these are actually um, the the logo here. Um, you can, uh, I think, are just more or less available. You can just download them. So a lot of us, we, we just we just got these kind of shirts on places that make them for anybody. Right? You just upload the, uh, the logo and they make them. So it's, cool. not, uh, it's not restricted in that way. Uh, you just have to download the file from the internet and, uh, and send it to your favorite shirt maker. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that after the show. Um, anyway, uh, what is, <laughs> uh, so what is an immediate interest for scientists once web is fully functional? Now, earlier, Klaus, you were telling me about the fact that you've got cycle one to look forward to. So 
what do you think are some of the first orders of business for web? Yeah, so you mean, you know, which are the first programs to be executed? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, yeah. So we, we don't know. Um, the, um, there, there's a category of programs called early release science programs. So those are meant to exercise the, all the different observing modes on the web uh, and all the different instruments uh, and then have the data being public immediately uh, after they're observed. So the whole astronomical community, you know, you know, there's nobody left behind and everybody can, can have an equal chance of look at the, uh, the web data. But those, those are intended to be observed within the first five months of normal science operations. Um, all the other programs sort of have equal priority and it basically comes down to uh, scheduling efficiency, which ones you know, literally go on first. Um, and that schedule hasn't, hasn't even been made yet. So I, I don't know. Um, so that's, that's not a real answer to that, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm as, as eager as anybody else to see what it will be. <laughs> there, there, there's a, there's a lot, I know there's an awful lot lined up for cycle one and actually cycles are what exactly again, we talk about cycle one, but, uh, what am I talking about when we say cycle one? Uh, it's one year. Yeah. Um, one, yeah. So cycle one lasts one year. Okay. Uh, we do, uh, oversubscribe. Uh, each cycle a little bit in terms of time we have there's more than 10,000 hours of observing time that's been awarded to, to actual programs and if you do the math uh, uh, you will find that a year has 8,760 some hours uh, so, so we've awarded more time than it is in a year and there's a good reason for that that is when we get to the end of that year if you also get to the end of your box of observations that you can pull out it's quite likely that the, the last one you pull out won't have a spot in the sky Right. Hmm. You won't be able to schedule it because it's it's where web can be looking at right now. So you want to oversubscribe it so you have a good selection to pick from also at the end of the cycle. Uh, so so those those the observations that won't have been done in that first year they'll it, they'll be like in a tail they'll be done eventually. Yeah. Um, so so yeah so it's fair to say that a cycle is one year. It's all about prioritization <laughs> and, and scheduling. Uh, so I know that you have to get going soon. So I'm just gonna uh, we'll take one more. Uh, Super, one more question. This is a, came in the form of a super chat uh, from Ali Wright. Uh, a five-year super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, have you seen the amazing web Lego model? <laughs> yeah, I have. I have. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Um, you know, it's been it's it's a model that has been submitted to the the Lego Ideas program, which is where anybody can submit a concept, and if you get ten thousand votes or more, it, it's it sort of goes to a Lego review. I guess I don't know exactly how they do it. Um, and so it, it, it has proceeded to that level of, of review. So, you know, of course, you know, I hope that Lego will do the right thing and, and pick that one for actual production. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, I know that, like I said, I know that you need to get going. I'm going to stick around here, but if you have to get going, just let me know when you have to jump off and it's totally fine. Uh, but uh, do you want to do yeah, another we, question? We can probably take, let's, we can take uh, take a couple of more questions. Okay, so, great. All right, so it sounds good to me. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, let me just find... Let me find uh, this question that I had here. Uh, well, it was uh, it was one that I think we already talked about before, but um, we talked about the web deep field. Uh, will it be looking at the exact same portion, this the Hubble deep field feel? But you know what I mean, like the exact same position in the sky. Do you have any ideas to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will. It will. Yeah, it's part of a big observation, but it includes the, that that Hubble ultra deep field. I think. It's it's, and that, that's been planned for a long time by, mm. by the instrument team. So that that's like, yeah, of course we're going to do that. <laughs> so it's going to return to that particular point in the sky. To that, to, li literally to that that point in the sky. That would be cool because then you'll just see like all these new galaxies suddenly pop out. You know, so uh, so can JWST somehow analyze if there is a life on some exoplanets? And we had a few questions before about searching for life, and now that's something that people are interested in. Um, so I guess there's really two questions here. You know, any evidence, any chance of web detecting evidence of life? Um, yeah, no, there, there, there is a chance. Um, I think we have to be. I think it'll be a long process, right? Just to set set expectations because this is a hard this is a hard thing to do. There, not life itself, right? But but what web will will look for uh, is bioindicators. So this is a combination of of uh, of different molecules in the planet's atmosphere. 
that we think can be need, needs a biological process to exist that way. Like so, for example, on Earth, the, the most famous uh, combination of molecules is methane and oxygen. Like if you have those together in the atmosphere, they would if life wasn't there to continuously produce the methane, the methane would burn off very quickly. It have, would have a very short lifetime. So you have to have a biological process uh, to do that. So that's a bio indicator. So it's like it's a suggestion that there may be something going on here. Obviously, it's not a picture of little green men or anything like that, but it's it's it would be a very interesting result uh, for Web to do that uh, in a planet like in Trappist One. Uh, or other like Earth-sized planets in the in the Goldilocks zone uh, is something that would take a lot of uh, uh, observations. Um, so these are done with with using the transit technique, like where the planet goes in front of of its star, um, and that gives you a, a because it, they, that transit takes a you know an hour or so. It gives you a limited amount of time to collect light, and so you need multiple transits to to beat down the noise and get enough signal to see if those kind of molecules are there. And we think we're going to need a lot of transits to do that. Um, so it's probably going to take quite a while to build up that kind of signal. Um, but again, we don't really know what we're going to see, and we might be uh, we might be surprised. So I think I think that's a good shot, but it's it's also going to be a difficult thing to do. So. Exactly. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll do one more uh, one more question here before you have to before you have to go, and uh, I. I'm not, I, I don't have time to bring it up right now, but um, I know that we're about to, uh, in a few minutes, we're going to be looking at NASA's uh, press coverage of, you know, what's next for web. But can you summarize for us, like, what are the immediate uh, next steps? We know that we're not going to be able to do observations for still a couple more months yet, correct? Uh, yeah, no, that, 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 that's certainly true. Um, so the whole, whole commissioning is six months long, right? So you, you shouldn't expect any science data until the very end of uh, June, beginning of July. Uh, with a nominal commissioning timeline. So what's going to happen next is we still have to wait for a little bit more cooling um, before we can turn on uh, the near infrared camera, near cam, which is an instrument that is used to focus the telescope. So right now the telescope is completely unfocused. And then it takes uh, uh, you know two and a half months, three months to actually focus the telescope. First, you focus it on near cam itself, which is an instrument that sort of sits in the middle. It's made for the best imaging quality because it's a near infrared camera. Uh, but you also have want to focus a telescope on all the other instruments that sort of sit or sit around it. And so that's a, that's a long and complicated process. And only once the telescope is is uh, is focused and fully commissioned, uh, which happens around uh, month four, then you can start to use the individual instruments to characterize them. Uh, to make sure that you understand that geometry in orbit and then to generally check them out so that uh, they can be ready for science. And that, that again, that takes another uh, another couple of months. Um, and so you add all that together and you end up with a six-month timeline. That's fantastic. Uh, so, Klaus, I want to thank you very much for coming on. I'll, I'll st Hey, everybody, I'm going to stick around for a little while longer. I know that Klaus has to get ready for another meeting. Um, this is part of his job as the uh, direct, as the James Webb Project Scientist at Space Telescope. So, Klaus, thank you very much for joining us today. I learned a lot, and I hope everybody else did too. If you don't mind, everybody, just showing Klaus some appreciation in the chat. A thumbs up, a go Klaus, a fist bump for Klaus. I think he's well earned it. And uh, Klaus, anything else you want to leave us with before you take off? No, thank thank you so much. I mean, it's been it's been great fun, and I think questions have been amazing. So they they have been, and I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, I'll I'll try to stick around and and talk to you guys for a little bit longer uh, before the uh, before the NASA presser comes on. But uh, thank you very much, Klaus, and uh, I'll be talking with you soon. All right. Take care. All right. So there he goes. Uh, that was Dr. Klaus. Uh, 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 that was that was Dr. Klaus Panatel. Boy, I'm I'm gonna mess up his name already. I am so sorry. I'm just terrible with getting stuff like that. Hey, uh, so yeah, we'll just take a little bit more time hanging out, just us, and uh, go over a few things. You know, one thing. Let me ask you guys this question. Um, I'm I'm working on a video, and normally I, you know, don't like. I'm not gonna do a video right now, but I'm I'm trying to help describe how Web orbits L2 without there being anything there to orbit, right? And this is a question that came up before, uh, and uh, Klaus discussed it. Um, 
let me see if I can show this to you and and you can just sort of tell me if this makes any kind of sense but I want to say this what I what I'm about to show you is something that I saw on Twitter so I cannot take credit whoops I'm on the wrong one here uh, so I can't take credit uh, for coming up with this all by myself but tell me if this makes sense I'm trying to help describe how it is possible that web can orbit something that doesn't exist right so here we have the sun we have web at earth and then we have l2 right that mathematical point out there so if we let web move out to l2 right this is what we want to do we would love to be able to just park it there but it turns out that's really really going to be very hard to do right that's you know a very precise position to be in takes a lot of fuel to sudden to come to a perfect stop you don't want to overshoot for all the problems that we talked about so here's the deal let's while we're here at l2 just pretend for a moment that we're here at l2 let's think about how is it that web can orbit this thing and so whenever you're talking about orbits you're talking about forces right you're talking about the forces of gravity right so you've got the gravitational force from the sun right i mean that kind of makes sense yeah and then you've got the gravitational force from earth as well right if you've ever taken like a high school physics class or a college intro physics class you get the idea and yeah this is really 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 about to scale right but there's another force that's happening and it's not a real physical force but it is like an apparent force and that's the centrifugal force right think about web you know it's being flung around as klaus was describing it's kind of you know being flung around the sun tethered by the gravitational strings of the sun and earth so you've got this centrifugal force and if everything's perfectly balanced you're gonna have the force of the sun plus the force of the earth exactly equaling the centrifugal force everybody okay with that so far hope you are all right let me now show you this okay and yeah what about oh uh, yeah and here's a great question right what about the gravitational force from the moon you're right there is a gravitational force from the moon but i'm going to ignore it for now just to keep it simple i'm oversimplifying this and then we'll make it more complex later on how's that sound all right so now we're going to go ahead and put web up there right we're going to you know we can't really get it right onto l2 but we can launch it so that it kind of goes right just above l2 let's say here we have a bit of a problem notice that you know the l2 is so far away from the sun right 1.5 million i'm sorry it's it's 151.5 million kilometers from the sun l2 is so far away from the sun that the sun's gravity is kind of the same basically right but the earth's gravity has changed a little bit okay and this is the key thing right because now it's a little bit farther away from earth and earth is a lot closer so if the sun if the, if the earth is not exerting quite as much gravity on on uh on web what does that do for the centrifugal force well it means that the centrifugal force is now actually greater for the first time right let me show you why you see how that force of gravity for earth is aimed kind of like in a diagonal let's split that up into its components right let's call it the x and the y directions okay the x and the y forces right so what's going to happen is that that x force that x component of earth's gravity force is weaker than it used to be because web is now a little bit farther away from earth so now the centrifugal force is actually greater right and what's that going to do if there's a little bit more force on this side of web a little bit more of a pulling force going this way where do you think web's going to go that's right it's going to go outward right so what we're going to do instead is we're going to fix this problem we don't want web let me go back a slide here yeah let me go back in this one we don't want web all right here's the thing friends we don't want to see web go off and do this because that's bad so let's not make it bad let's make it good and the trick the trick to this is you actually don't go to l2's distance you go just a little bit short of it let's call it l2 prime right now we're at l2 prime we're a little bit closer the gravity from earth is a little bit stronger and now the x component of earth's gravity is just strong enough to once again help the sun completely cancel out the centrifugal force right the the the, the centrifugal force is canceled and now web is stable but isn't web going to just drop down i mean there is a force of gravity from earth in the y direction so isn't web just going to drop down the answer is yeah so how do we fix that well, we give it a push right we 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 take web whoops sorry yep we take web we give it a push and we push it into the screen okay like that right and now 
it falls away as well as falling down at the same time and those two forces combine to form an orbit. So what's holding this thing in quote orbit? The centrifugal force in the Y component, right? So you get the idea. So we have a halo centrifugal force. I hope this is making sense. And, uh, and so Grack is asking, okay, but, uh, but the centrifugal force is larger. Yeah, I probably didn't get the lengths of my vectors uh, completely right. I was kind of slapping this thing together <laughs> this morning as, you know, as I was eating breakfast trying to think, oh, how can I explain this? But anyway, I saw this uh, on Twitter and I can't take credit for it. I just, I just love this explanation. I thought I would do my own treatment of it. But the, so, so the point that I'm trying to make here is that it is orbiting l2 right it's orbiting around l2 but even though there's no physical object at l2 okay there is a combination of gravitational forces and so what it's doing is that it's it wants to fall downward to get back to the sun earth line because earth's gravity wants to pull it partly downward and it's trying to fall toward earth but there is a center there's two centrifugal forces now one that's trying to keep it trying to keep it moving outward and one that's trying to have it move upward and so it just falls around it so um how did they discover the l2 orbit well the work was first pioneered by a mathematician named lagrange that's why we call l2 l because it's one of two of the five lagrangian points and uh as far as developing the orbit around it i'm not really sure but one of the pioneers was another mathematician called lisa Jouz, i think so anyway uh, so, okay, I hope that explained. I did that very, very quickly. Uh, but Ditmar, Ditmar asks, so additionally, how frequently will it have to correction applied to compensate for the solar wind push? And yeah, you're right. There is a solar, not solar wind, but there is solar radiation, right? There's actual radiation pressure. Sunlight pushes on uh, the spacecraft. That is going to uh, destabilize the orbit. So it turns out that what they're going to be doing uh, is they're going to be, I'll go over here. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be monitoring Webb's position very carefully. And then about every 21 days, they're going to do a little tiny little burn. They're just fire the engine for just a moment or two, just enough to keep that orbit uh, nice and steady. Once again, nothing dramatic, nothing amazing, nothing like, oh my God, Webb's going to fall away. We have to burn for home. It's very no drama. Actually, here's the thing. It's not that web is going to fall away from Earth. It's going to fall back toward Earth. Okay, they actually don't want to take the risk of putting web right on L2 because then if it goes off in this direction, they can't turn it around and thrust for home. So what they really are doing is they're actually trying to push it almost all the way up that hill, but never quite to the top and let it just start to roll back ever so slightly, give it a tiny little burn, and they'll just do this about once every 21 days. It doesn't take a whole lot of fuel to make those tiny adjustments. These are very low drama uh, burns, you might say. So uh, let's see. Um, all right. Uh, so are the corrections they make with the propulsions uh, kind of pre-scheduled? So the nominal plan is to conduct a burn every 21 days. Uh, as to whether or not they're actually going to execute that burn on 21 days, depends right they may have to okay that microphone is very directional yeah sorry about that they may make an adjustment a little here a little there they're always going to be uh done you know when they decide it's it's right to do that uh so how does web change its orientation it does use reaction wheels uh so it will use reaction wheels to spin in one direction web will then counter spin in the opposite direction and that's how web will maintain its pointing uh so uh, are they planning on making use of the other uh, Lagrangian points with uh, satellites? Actually, they do. Uh, they Remember, there's an L2 that's opposite the Sun-Earth line, but there's also an L1 in between the Sun-Earth, right? Not directly between, it's much closer to Earth. That's exactly where you want to go to put your Sun-facing spacecraft. And we have several Sun-spacing spacecraft, Sun-spacing, Sun-facing spacecraft that are observing the sun things like the solar heliospheric observatory the solar dynamics observatory lots and lots of sun facing spacecraft plus there's another earth facing spacecraft called discover at l1 looking back 
taking a picture of the full disk of Earth that you can look at all the time. Uh, so, uh, let's see. So how does fuel not contaminate the mirrors? Yeah, we talked about these thruster firings. The thing to remember is that all of the thruster nozzles are on the sun side of the shield, right? Remember, there's a great big shield there. The telescope is over here. The thrusters are all over here. So it's sort of like a self protect a self protection mechanism. Uh, the exhaust plume is directed away from the telescope at all times. Uh, what would Webb do if we lose contact? Well, um, that would be bad. So let's not lose contact. No, I'm sure Webb would probably find a job. You know. Anyway, so friends, I think uh, that's about it for today. I NASA is now hosting their uh, What's Next for Webb press conference over on their channel on YouTube. So I invite you to go and check that out. And thank you so much for spending time with me today. This is just a very quick, threw it together, last minute kind of, hey, you want to do this? Sure, why not? And you all showed up and I can't tell you just how thankful and grateful I am for all of you. So we got a lot more coming your way uh, to talking about web and, and believe it or not, other things going on in the universe, I promise. But right now I'm, I'm kind of wrapped around the web axle. So until next time, have a wonderful day and thank you so much for your support and stay curious, my friends. Good night.